Thanks very much, Jackie, and to you, David, again, for really having uh, organized such a wonderful meeting. It has been great seeing everyone uh, in person after three years. I don't know if the secret for the society is only to hold the meeting every three years. What do you think? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> in three years, a lot happens, and uh, it so, it's really excites me to see some of the new things that are going on in our field that we weren't even really talking about before the pandemic. And we're going to get a bit of a tour of that today from our three outstanding speakers. Uh, at my far from me is Zhongwen Zhan from, from Caltech, who has been leading, as, as many of you know, some ex exciting work using gas technology and applying it to, uh, to seismology. So that's the data side. On the, on the computation side, we have Alice Gabriel from Munich, who has been really thrilling us with the types of supercomputing that she has been doing. I would also note that she was the Richter awardee just two years ago. So Alice, we're delighted to have you here today. And finally, we have Simon Stoller here from the ETH in Zurich, who's going to take us to some new worlds, literally, in his talk. So the format is going to be to have three short talks. Uh, following each of them, we'll take a burning question, either from someone in the audience or online, and then we're going to have a discussion. And really, my job is just to sit back and to make sure that the discussion rolls along. We have microphones here, so when you have questions, please don't hesitate to queue up and we'll get to them. And we're looking for a really uh, very interesting and entertaining hour here. So with no further ado, uh, we'll get started. And uh, Elise, I think you're up first. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, thank you, uh, Jackie and David, for having me. I really had an amazing uh, conference so far. And the best of all is to see so many seismologists um, in 3D. <laughs> thank you for this. Um, and in real life. And I'm really excited to contribute a couple of thoughts about um, high performance computing as a frontier in seismology as a, a member of this panel with my um, esteemed uh, young colleagues here. And um, what you see on this uh, title slide um, is there um, a picture of arguably not the fastest, not the largest, but maybe the most scenic supercomputer um, worldwide. This is Mare Nordstrom, it's 154,000 um, compute cores, and it's housed in a um, deconsecrated chapel in Barcelona. And the animation is one example of what you can do with these machines. This is through unraveling the complexity of uh, the dynamic rupture process that connected all of these different fault segments throughout the 2016 Kaikoura New Zealand earthquake here, um, nonlinearly linked to the seismic waves radiating away from fault rupture. <clears throat> So high-performance computing has been pioneering seismology over the last decades. At the same time, also us seismologists have been pushing and advancing high-performance computing with the kind of problems and challenges that we want them to help us to solve. And uh, why is that? The reason is simple. Seismology is data-rich, and uh, often we can be treating our problems as simple linear um, systems, for example, of hyperbolic partial differential equations, which are really suitable to be distributed um, across massively parallel um, multi-core machines. And uh, we've been using these techniques to, for example, image Earths and uh, other planets' interior to understand um, the dynamics of the mantle or to track down energy resources. And we're doing so by um, calculation of synthetic seismograms um, in uh, variable complexity of Earth or other planet models, and for example, solving seismic inverse problems. And a common approach is um, to seek a time domain solution of the evolving seismic wave field um, solved by domain decomposition. So that means we're splitting up our problem into many small chunks that again, being distributed across a machine and each processor is taking over solving um, one part of the problem. Um, in the spirit of open data sharing, seismologists have been also contributing and establishing widely used um, open source community software tools. And uh, we're still advancing these as a community in uh, reaching um, higher resolution and in increasing um, efficiency and uh, allowing for more realistic and uh, more um, representative models of how our Earth looks like. <clears throat> So seismology is data rich, 
And uh, this is thanks to observational advances such as machine learning enhanced seismic catalogs, um, space geodesy, um, seismic array data processing, and of course, distributed acoustic sensing. And this is a beautiful example um, how at, at the fault system that was hosting the 2016-2017 um, um, Central Italy earthquake sequence is lighting up in all of its complexity if you're looking at it through the lens of machine learning enhanced um, relocation of seismicity. How often, we often remain relatively model poor. And um, it is worthwhile to point this out, um, which I want to highlight with one uh, very humble attempt um, that we recently um, performed in trying to understand how um, an actual natural fault zone would be interacting um, co seismic rupture when we're accounting for um, a fault damage zone that you can see here in an exploded few, consisting of more than 1,000 uh, varying various um, sized um, fractures that are being triggered by a perturbation, initial perturbation, they're hosting cascading dynamic slip and eventually activating a main fault producing around a magnitude six earthquake. It's worthwhile to embrace uh, this challenge and to do this um, on the scale of natural complexity because it actually tells us also something about the fundamental of earthquake physics. So we've seen to be able to realistically model the dynamics of small rupture and large rupture in the same simulation, we actually have to revisit some of the fundamental uh, uh, concepts of earthquake physics. In this case, um, the scale dependence of fracture energy, which we are correcting here for core seismic restrengthening to be able to model um, the physics of small ruptures and large ruptures um, in the same simulation. <coughs> High performance computing allows for data driven and physics based models at the same time. So these concepts are not mutually exclusive. Um, and this allows us to integrate synergistically the emerging um, diversity of observations of the seismic wave field and of how faults are slipping. And we can do that by accounting for multiphysics um, and cross scale in our simulations. The example I chose here um, is an illustration of how solving inverse problems and forward problems, uh, data driven and physics based together, can help us here to understand um, the broadband seismic wave field. This is um, what you see here in the smooth top uh, panel. Second. This is actually the best dynamic rupture earthquake model of the 2016 Amatrice earthquake out of a million visited simulations, um, which were performed in a dynamic source inversion of the dense strong count motion network uh, using a Bayesian MCMC approach. However, this um, in inverse uh, approach is restricted to account for maybe half a hertz of the uh, frequency content of these stations to do still be um, computational limitations. Now we can enhance these setups um, with uh, um, ingredients that we know are important to understand the high frequency part of the seismic wave field, for example, fault roughness or topography. And we did that here um, by including these ingredients and really pushing um, the synthetics in the range of uh, very close to observational um, high frequency content. So the, uh, uh, which you can see in this comparison here, where the black line is the observed um, Fourier um, acceleration amplitude spectra and um, the uh, red line, sorry if I have that right, is um, the rough fault with topography. So my point here is um, <coughs> that um, we can also use these, uh, these kind of approaches to actually account quantitatively for the effect of these physical um, ingredients. So here, for example, this allows us um, to uh, quantify the additional uh, resistance that a rough fault poses to uh, rupture generation because we have to keep the data-driven um, low-frequency match of the seismograms but enhancing the physics-based high-frequency match. So this is around um, 3 megapascal additional shear resistance in this example. Okay, um, if you're talking about high performance computing, we should also be talking about the cost. And with costs, I don't only mean um, the student that has to be um, learning how to run these models on a supercomputer, I mean monetary cost, and I also mean cost for our environment. Um, I show here an example, which is an expensive simulation in, um, in our group. These are two earthquake scenarios that are talking to each other in terms of dynamic and static stress transfers of the foreshock and the main shock of um, the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. These models are complex. They include 3D community models, um, the 3D SCAC um, <coughs> velocity model, the stress model. They uh, account for off-fault deformation to be able to map co-seismic evolution of faults on with. They have uh, five hertz in the uh, um, seismic wave field that's um, emitted a viscoelastic attenuation and so on. We do include all of these ingredients because we really want to integrate a full breadth of observations we have of these events. Doing that costs 
170,000 CPU hours. That's expensive. Um, in terms of money, uh, energy charged, my value here is probably completely outdated, um, but it would be $320. Um, if we're asking AWS to run the simulation without any academic discounts, that's $6,500 or um, equivalent of two barrels of um, oil, or instead of running these models, I could also um, be flying from London to Los Angeles. Um, so this is a very strong uh, motivation to optimize the efficiency of seismological community software. And of course, keep in mind these numbers are machine dependent. <coughs> Another motivation for uh, optimizing or using modern software, hardware, and algorithmically advances is that we can reach scales that were completely out of reach just a couple of years ago. One of examples is that we can use physics-based models to understand the dynamics of megatrust earthquakes and the tsunamis they are generating. This is challenging because we have to cover very large space and time scales. So the simulation running is the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, um, which ruptured for more than five minutes, breaking 1,500 kilometers of fault zones. Um, we also challenged by uh, the geometric complexity of subduction zones and by the observation, uh, observational sparsity and asymmetry of the data that we have to constrain and validate these models. So we've been uh, taking up this challenge in a year-long fruitful collaboration with computational scientists. And I just want to highlight a reference list there. I want to highlight this because it shows that our problems are actually rewarding for, for example, computational science um, PhD students. Um, they're pleading at um, problems to solve um, on the computational science and on the applied math um, front. And um, the first thing we had to think about is that we're stepping away from typical approaches that are codes, methods that are used in the community because we wanted to have a um, numerical method, a solver, that allows us to include very complicated geometries. We also wanted to zoom in into regions where there's interesting multiphysics, so for example, where we want to resolve frictional failure on these faults, we want to use um, friction laws that are coming from the laboratory, very small scale. In other regions where we don't have observational constraints or not much interesting um, multiphysics is going on, we want to have large elements because we want to save computational cost. Then there's a huge list, or kind of an extensive list, of different optimization strategies we've been following. The important part is that this is an end-to-end -end, um, optimization process. That means for make these models usable, we have to also look into input. How can we read in all of the data sets that we are producing as a community all the way to output and visualization. And, and then we've been doing things like taking over the job of the compiler and optimizing the way we're doing, uh, we're multiplying our matrices that are specific to this problem. Um, we've been developing a geoinformation server that's optimizing input output, and there's a lot of um, interesting aspects here. Okay, if we're doing all of this, we can do um, hero runs. So these are record, full machine, large, um, covering large supercomputers worldwide simulations, yielding synthetics of really unprecedented um, resolution. Uh, the important point is that doing this kind of hero simulations tickles down all the way to the um, code that my students or other students are using on their laptops, on university servers, or in Docker containers during computational training, since the hardware is the same. It's the same chips, the same processes that are being used in these large supercomputers that you are using um, in your mobile phone. Fukaku, the largest supercomputer, is using ARM chips, the same uh, mobile phone um, processors that we are using because of their low energy consumption, and it really um, tickles down um, to um, applicability for our students. <coughs> and what we can do with these models, just uh, two quick examples. This is um, studying the effect of locking depth and shallow coupling in Cascadia physics-based earthquake simulations done by Marlon Ramos um, with uh, Yeo Huang, just published last year. Um, and uh, this is a paper where we've been identifying what are the regional um, key factors that we need to better understand to be able to, to do these physics-based simulations, for the example, of the 2004 um, Sumatra earthquake. And uh, what we've been doing here is to use um, a whole range of geophysical observations to constrain the initial conditions. Um, how strong is our fault? What is the friction drop? What is um, the stress drop of these simulations? Um, <clears throat> we used independent data sets that I don't have time to go through to verify um, these models. And these are really interdisciplinary from acoustic uh, to um, 
multi-component moment tensor inversion uh, to seismic and geodetic observations. And then we produced the first forward models, not an inversion, the first model that can actually unify the dynamics of the earthquake and the tsunami. And we highlight the importance of three factors, um, loading, for example, also variations along arc um, in uh, convergence rate, rigidity, so especially the very strong reduction of um, rigidity um, close to the trench, and um, sediment strength, and the latter is important since uh, core seismic deformation of soft sediments has a strong impact on uplift and tsunami generation. It also pushes slip away from the trench and localizes it down dip. <clears throat> so by unifying all of these observations on scale of, of these actual events, we can reduce the complexity of these models and break down um, the importance of all of the complexity of our Earth to few key factors that we need to constrain. <clears throat> So how will exascale supercomputing advance seismology? Exascale um, is the size of the machines that are just being installed now. So that means they're capable of running 10 to the 19 floating point operations per second. The some of the simulations I showed you before were multi-petaflop scale, so that means um, a couple of factors of 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second. Um, and it's important for us as a community to prepare to take advantage of this infrastructure that is being built. I have two points here. Um, we are just at the verge of stepping away from doing scenario-based, um, physics-based data-driven models. We can run many of these simulations, um, for example, informing probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, um, complementing empirical approaches. Um, we can do source inversion, as I showed. We could uh, do a joint sensitivity analysis, UQ, and inform um, network design. And I have uh, a highlight here of uh, combining HPC and machine learning approaches, which is a post of John Rikorsky that he presented yesterday, of um, using physics-based simulations together with machine learning to get quick, quickly evaluated um, shake maps. I know I'm, I'm a little bit late, so I will, I will finish up. <clears throat> Um, the other point is rapid data-driven and physics-based simulations. As a community, we have the responsibility to um, provide the knowledge we have from uh, physics and deterministic simulations in the event of uh, large disastrous events. Um, and uh, having an allocation, for example, on large national computing centers will allow us to do so um, in um, the actual response time that's required. Then we have realistic models. With this, I mean we account for nonlinear rheology, for example, geometry, and this means um, also looking at solving different equations. So this is an example here of using um, seismic acoustic coupled simulations. This is the bang that you see being induced by a very small earthquake magnitude 1.7 event in um, Helsinki, and the loudness maps, the nuisance that people are feeling can be used to better constrain um, <coughs> um, the hazard and also the physics of these small events. These are models that are trying to account for um, nonlinear damage. And we can also think about modeling full seismic cycles that is stepping away from uh, um, wave propagation simulations only. And with this, um, I just want to end by stating that we need to embrace interdisciplinarity to take advantage of these developments. And uh, there's a lot of ongoing uh, funded projects that help us to do so. And I just want to highlight some of them in Europe and also um, in the US that uh, I've highlighted here. And I have one link here to explain maybe this digital twin co concept because there's a project called DTGU which is developing um, digital twin components specific for solid earth uh, to make uh, yeah, these kind of models being part of a larger um, effort to establish um, digital twins of um, really ongoing um, challenges and uh, across sciences. And with this, thanks for um, listening. <laughs> for this, this uh, uh, tour of what's in the forefront of, of, of computational seismology today. Do we have a burning question that someone has that they need to ask now? We have, a, we have floodlights in our eyes. Apparently not. So we'll go ahead and Thank you. We'll, we'll move on to Zhang Wen. I so, conveniently filled the time yeah, of yeah. talking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. you so you, you, uh, my your mic is on, so you don't need to use the podium. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Be, yeah. Okay. So uh, my title is Enabling Seismology Plus X with Distributed Acoustic Sensing. So I'm sure you all have heard before terms like computing science plus X, machine learning plus X, or something plus X. Uh, we are often the X, right? So I hope you know by this talk I can convince you we can be something as well. <laughs> So um, the succession is out of frontiers, and frontier, by definition, 
it's kind of unknown, or at least not obvious unless someone shows to you. Uh, in this case, it's really, you know, my postdocs and the graduate students are showing what is possible to me. So the work presented here are larger to their credit. Uh, they are amazing, and most importantly, they are all on job market. So grab them when you see a can. Okay, so long, long ago, before the pandemic, okay, I presented this slide on AGU for a meeting, try to visualize the evolution of seismic networks. So you can see on this quality and quantity plot, in majority of the history, it has been a steady increase in both quantity and quality. But that curve kind of saturated, right? You cannot really increase a very high quality measurement for uh, orders of magnitude more sensors. And since then, it has been taking a different trend. So we're going for a lot more sensors of lower quality. And I was thought DAS would be a perfect technology to continue that trend because of the other uh, features shown here. And of course, right now, I think the trend largely holds and it's proceeding even faster than I thought. The quality is getting better of DAS. The range has increased by a factor of 10 since that presentation, and the cost is decreasing too. These factors are leading to many important experiments and produce spectacular uh, wave records, like the one shown here. This is the magnet 6 earthquake detected on a 100 kiloton DAS array. Basically, I have 10,000 sensors in 10 meter spacing. So this is the kind of data we're seeing more and more these days. So to fully embrace this uh, uh, significance of the progress, maybe like this bar of length scale interest would be useful. The conventional seismic networks have tens of kilometer spacing, but can cover hundreds of kilometers or thousands of kilometers. And nodal type arrays or geophones push this by two orders of magnitude down. But the problem is most nodal arrays are temporary, so you cannot provide monitoring capability. And what that's providing is really a broader scale coverage with continuous monitoring capabilities. And how does this affect all the science we are doing? And there are many topics. So what I did, I just look at the tectonic, eh, technic sessions of this SSA meeting, just put some keyword here. Hopefully that's representative. Your interest over here. And you can see that that really can really impact the left end of these bars here, pushing to uh, smaller scales here. Just give you a few examples. Subduction zone. On the first plenary uh, session on Wednesday, we talk about how submarine observations can really improve subduction zone size. Actually, there have been plenty of studies on submarine dust. Many of them are in subduction zones. I was actually lucky to participate in this community dust experiment offshore Oregon. Uh, using two NSF OI cables turned to multiple DAS arrays. The data is actually freely available for you to use. So this is the kind of new science we can potentially do. Another one is earthquake rupture process. The same data I showed you earlier, the magnitude 6 earthquake, Jia Xuan Li was able to use that data to identify four sub-events over this earthquake, plotted on top of the relatively smooth USGS model. This is the kind of resolution you used to only achieve for like 2004 Parkfield earthquake when you have a dense array nearby. This is the very first time we see such an event on DAS and we achieve this kind of resolution. Just imagine what we can do when we can do this kind of resolution imaging for any magnitude 6 or larger earthquake in California with multiple DAS arrays, right? So this is gonna reveal new science here. But of course, there's many more things we can do with DAS. But I would say these are not, these are all great seismology, but not the X. To qualify for this X, you need to have your own ology, right? Zoology, right? So, uh, you know, those people by definition do not come to SSA automatically, right? So, you know, some, you know, if you are one of those experts, welcome to SSA, I hope you come back uh, regularly. But, you know, these are the fears, such as what I have in mind, volcanology, glaciology, hydrology, oceanography. Right? So they kind of go kind of on a shorter scale, you know, all broad. But one common feature of these fears is not only the shorter scale, they have processes that are very time dependent. You need continuous record to capture important processes. And that's where that is going to be really critical. To give you some examples here, volcanology first. This is uh, the, you know, you know, volcanology and the seismology have a long history together, right? 
you know, I, by no means I say those fears, we have not made a contribution. I just mean that that really enables us to scale up their uh, impact. For example, in this Long Valley Caldera, for this technology here, the conventional seismic network is sort of right in the caldera and more to the south of the array, uh, of the caldera, because the majority of the seismicity shown as the red colors are all to the south. Right? So it's very limited coverage in this case, but we were lucky to have convert the red line to the right figure, a telecom cable to a 100 kilometer long death array. This is the same one used to study that earthquake. And this is a small earthquake detected by this array, and you can see beautiful P and S waves. The seeker line is actually Wei Chang Zhu's uh, machine learning based peaking of the PNS waves. And the thinner line is a prediction from our best 3D model for the region right now. And you can see difference, and that's what enables us to improve the model. And here is the initial model at about two kilometers below the surface, and this is the new model, right? And you can see not only the feature uh, at Long Valley Caldera becoming much more detailed, they're actually brand new features all the way in the Mono Lake with a connection in between. And if you look at the left figure here, that connection is actually coincided with something called Mono craters, a chain of craters, still active in the last couple of thousand years. I mean, this is still preliminary. We're gonna add a lot more data to this, but this cannot be wrong, right? You know, this just you know, makes sense. You know, how often can you see that in tomography, right? So it's, 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 it's amazing. <laughs> Um, so, so this is uh, volcanology, and the glaciology is another field where you need very dense arrays to study an ice layer of hundreds of meters or kilometers thick, and you also want to know about the basal structures. And it's not hard to see why that has great potential here on ice, or sometimes in ice. Uh, actually, in this study by Boost et al., they drill the borehole all the way to the bottom of Greenland uh, uh, glacier, and then put a fiber in, turn that into a vertical array, and when one person sits comfortably in a tent, and the other guy just, you know, bound the ice with a hammer, and they get a beautiful record like this, even reflection from the bottom of the glacier, right? This is amazing uh, observation here. Uh, one thing we probably have to improve that to make it even more useful in this scenario is probably power consumption. Right now, the co consumption is pretty high, so you have to have a generator to run it, so it probably won't last very long. All those experiments are pretty short. If one day we can do long-term observations, that would be amazing. Hydrology. Hydrology is an entire huge field than, you know, by itself. It's much bigger than seismology. Uh, but here, I'm mostly you know, thinking about like, groundwater and soil moisture studies. In the last few years, there has been a lot of very interesting studies using ambient noise to monitor how seismic velocity change can reflect you know, groundwater fluctuations, the so-called DV or V measurement. Right? So in this particular example here, this is in Ridgecrest Dust Array along an eight kilometer profile in the horizontal axis here. We have two years of data. The color shows the DVROV uh, variations. The warmer color is showing where seismic velocity is decreasing. So you see very clear seasonal patterns with the de decrease coincide with the rainy winter seasons. And uh, actually, you can get this kind of understanding from conventional stations. But the key here is what exactly caused the change. Is it soil moisture? Is it groundwater? Or is it just merely temperature, for example, if you see seasonal change? But with dust arrays, such as fine spacing and long profile, we have observed this in a broad frequency band. The figure to the right is for a few frequency bands between two and eight hertz. And you can see the high frequency has a bigger change, the, the, the long period has a smaller change. By looking at this carefully, we are actually convinced this is actually coming from soil moisture in the top 10 meters. So it's actually not from groundwater in this case. The groundwater is actually at about a 70 meter depth, right? So, but soil moisture in the top few meters is actually extremely hard to measure for hydrologists, right? So this is actually very useful data for them. Uh, you know, it's just in the beginning, but we expect a lot of growth in this direction as well. And actually, if you look at the difference in the seasonal change, this is the 2021 drought. So there, the, 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 the shadow layer actually become a lot drier compared to the previous year. Finally, is oceanography. Oceanography out of the list here is probably the most remote from seismologists. Because we used have not many sensors in the ocean, uh, when we did have them, you know, all those ocean waves and current, we consider them noise. Uh, and we try to get rid of them, right? But 
That's because we don't have a dense enough observation to capture those processes. They are pretty short lens scale. Our observation is completely aliased. If you have that, now you can capture the full process, and that can open up a lot of opportunity for new science. So this is the example uh, by uh, Ethan Williams. So in this case, the left figure show a uh, five minutes observation of dust on a two kilometer fiber section here. And the signal you see here is a wave propagating at about 10 meters per second. This is actually a pressure signal from the ocean surface gravity waves. So it's sort of like our MB noise in seismic case, but it's this surface gravity waves. And what Ethan did is to generalize our seismic noise interferometry method into ocean surface gravity waves and do the same kind of DVRV measurement over their time. And we can achieve that on the figure to the right. You can see the cross correlation function kind of fluctuate. We can measure DVRV over every two hours. And in this case, it's not because the phase velocity of water wave is changing. You know, the water property doesn't change. It's because the ocean current is actually carrying your wave. So it's a Doppler effect causing apparent velocity change. And if you know that, now we can actually derive the current measurement. We can now measure the current measurement continuously over a long profile. And you can see on the bottom of the figure, it shows a pretty good correlation consistency with the oceanographic models. And the difference is probably the interesting part that what they don't know or that they don't include in the model, such as the internal waves. So this is another way we can contribute to the oceanographic studies. Of course, don't forget that, you know, because gas can also observe earthquake T waves, which are essentially acoustic wave in the ocean, we can also use it to measure ocean temperatures. So that's also a very exciting opportunity uh, for the future. So this is my concluding slides. I would say that the figure to the left, you know, the trend I was thinking about really largely holds true, and it's actually proceeding more quickly than I thought. And, and the new understanding I have in the last few years during the pandemic is it really shouldn't think about that as a big number of channels. It's really helping us to push to higher resolution, smaller lens scales, and it has continuous monitoring capabilities. It's this combination that opens up our access to some new field. Some of this field is brand new to us. Some of the field we had some impact in the past, but we can really scale up that impact uh, in the future. So I would say that is really enabling a new level of interdisciplinary research for seismology. And we can be the something uh, instead of just the X there, right? In case I'm not super clear, that's the frontier. Uh, let's go for it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John Wen. Let's see if we have uh, one question that has come in. It's a, it's a quiet group out there. Okay. There's one quick question from, from online. Maybe you can read very quickly. So the question is, uh, for the DAS network uh, of the future, should we aim at piggyback existing or commercial fibers, or should we be deploying our own to physical fibers? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, clearly, with so many different X scientific topics, it's going to have to be different, right? If you're going to Glacier, I'm pretty sure there's not going to be a fiber for you, so you have to deploy your own. <laughs> We're also thinking about, like, you know, Simon, we're going to talk about this, maybe. It's on the moon. Well, you know, we are not going to have a telecom cable there. So there are cases you have to have your own fiber. But in most other places, I would say the most important thing is to scale up, right? Scale up to a large you know, domain. And there, I think, you know, leverage pre-existing telecom infrastructure is probably the most efficient way. Uh, and there's a lot of work need to be done between our community and the telecom uh, community there. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. And so our, our, our final third talk, yes, is, is going to be by Simone, who's going to take us someplace new. <laughs> yes, and I, uh, thanks, uh, Shengwen. I really like your one talk with the length scales and the number of instruments. So we would fall off the, one of your plots on the left side and the other one on the right side with the length scale of the whole planet and a single station. Um, 
So I'll take you to, obviously, to boldly go somewhere else into the solar system and maybe just to start here with the way we're used to doing seismology on Earth. We're going alone into the field or we maybe have 101 um, trusty master student who carries all our equipment uh, through the snow and then we install a station somewhere and basically we're in control of it. Those of you who do marine seismology, of course, you know you can't go alone. You have typically 20 or so seismologists, scientists on a research vessel. You have another 20 crew members bringing you to the place where you actually want to do the science. Now with planetary science, we're talking about this number of people and the number of seismologists on this picture is probably the same than on the previous one, maybe 10 to 20. While the other 200 people are aerospace engineers, people who operate a um, communications network and everybody who act, or people who actually send your spacecraft, tell your spacecraft to switch on the seismometer or not. And this is really a gigantic effort that here in this case NASA has put into and therefore a great privilege for us seismologists to actually be using these data on another planet. What did it give us in the end, us seismologists? We finally got a seismogram on the cover of science for the first time in 15 years. Now the question is, when was the last time actually? Thank you, thank you. Last time was the Great Sumatra earthquake and it had a, an actual seismogram together with a SPECFAM simulation at the time. And I just happened to look into this, uh, into this um, issue of science and there was an article, The Interior of Mars, purely coincidentally. And in this article, which talks about mineralogy and the constraints on the interior, there's this one sentence that I liked very much. So the size of the Martian core is the least constrained physical parameter of the planet and space missions with multiple landers equipped with seismometers are required to precisely determine the size of the core. So that was 2005. And in 2021, we were able to do with one seismometer in the end. And the question is, why were we actually, of course, why were we able to do with one? Of course, because nobody funded us multiple seismometers, so we had to do with one. But also what changed in seismology in the time? And I think one thing that really changed is the availability of community codes that actually that are of high quality, that are of reproducible quality, and that allow various teams to work independently to, for example, in this case here, just clean up extremely noisy um, data using polarization filtering to get out actually SCS or the um, shear wave back from the core. Of course, these polarization methods, they were developed in the late 1990s or even earlier with some of them. But maybe in 2005, there was the HP4 OpsPy, the HP4 Pyroco, the HP4 other community codes where you can easily basically tell a student, look, take this code, you know how to do Python, you know how to do uh, plotting in Python and everything. Now take the seismological package and actually continue to work on it. So therefore, when I uh, saw this SES reflection, I was super convinced of it, of course, but others in the team were not. But the availability of community software actually helped other people to reproduce these results very quickly. And so we reached a consensus in the team and then also could uh, convince a few reviewers that we actually had seen the core. And I think that wouldn't have been necessarily possible some 20 years ago and definitely not in the Viking age before that. Um, so that slide should have gone, um, and I'll skip that quickly in the interest of time. Because one other thing that we, um, if you look a bit on where Mars, or what was new on Mars compared to the Earth, so that is a figure that shows good old coda Q uh, to the power of minus one. So therefore, the lower you are here, the longer the coda rings on of one of your quakes. It's good Kitiaki uh, style um, analysis. So this comes from a paper from a student um, in Toulouse, Sabrina Menina published in BSSA last year. It's probably, maybe most of you haven't seen the paper, most of you haven't seen the figure. Nevertheless, I like it very much because what you see here is actually the coda cue, so the amount of scattering that you see on Earth in various settings. Um, more stable settings, here um, volcanics, and of course, we just know Earth doesn't have a lot of scattering. Then you see here the moon, and the moon has always been this outlier. This is not really seismology, what you do on the moon. Seismology is on Earth, there's not a lot of scattering. Um, while the moon is so terrible, it has all the scattering. Now we have a third planet in the team, and actually it's a bit more Team Moon than Team Earth in the end. And so maybe Earth is in a way the outlier, and that's what we are used to on mantle scale on the Earth, on crustal scale, that waves propagate without much scattering. You can clearly identify wave fronts. That is not actually uh, what is usually happening. It's not even what is happening on Earth most of the time. If you go to volcanoes, if you go to very small scales, go to concrete, you do have so much scattering that you don't have clear ballistic waves anymore. But I think, it, at least for me, it was a bit of a surprise actually to really the identification of a transparent mantle that is something specific to Earth and not necessarily anywhere else in the solar system. 
because, for example, if you look at the surface of Mercury here, uh, you definitely won't find less scattering on the moon on this planet that has impact craters all over the place. By the way, uh, just uh, a thing that I, um, my daughter read an astronomy book for kids and it has a qu had a quick quiz question. The quiz question was how, do we, how many impact craters do we have on Earth? 10, 100, or 1,000? And I had been so used to looking at Mars and planets, so there's oh, 1,000 at least. The question, actually the answer was 100. So on Earth we have only 100 impact craters. We have 100 impact craters on this one image of Mercury here and of Mars the same. So therefore every other planet's surface will be much more fractured by impact cratering. And therefore we need, if we want to go to space, do seismology elsewhere, we need to be able to handle scattering. So we will go to the moon as seismologists. There's a mission funded um, from JPL um, that places one seismometer by a robot mission. If there will be a human landing on the moon in the next years, they will also carry seismometers. Let's say if they carry, for example, here, they land at the side of a low base carp, so maybe a buried thrust fault on the moon. Um, if they go with their one single seismometer, they will not learn a lot in the end. So I hope that most of them will carry at least a small array or even an array of arrays where you have a few stations and you can actually look at the incident angle of wave fields. Um, but I'm, even then, I am skeptical whether given the amount of scattering that we already know, we can learn a lot. So this is why I'm actually super excited about the question of bringing dust to another planet, where we can now actually observe the full wave field passing through it. But on the other hand, that also brings the, there is still, I think that still requires a lot of theoretical development on our side, actually understanding how a highly scattered wave field will, be, uh, will translate into what is observed by DAS, which is, of course, only a strain in a certain direction and not the full wave field. But then there would be a huge benefit for that for exploration of the moon, so just a shallow surface, finding water, finding frozen ice there or something, but then also hopefully translating back to um, applications like volcanoes on Earth. And then uh, after that, of course, uh, after the next decades will become crazy uh, if seismology continues there. I mean, the one thing, of course, Venus is the question, can we ever place a seismometer on the surface? We probably cannot. It's just too hot. Basically, anything at 500 degrees will only operate for a few um, hours. So I really enjoyed a great talk from um, Siddharth uh, from JPL yesterday, where they actually do investigate the opportunity of having um, infrasound sensors on balloons in the more temperate upper part of the Venus atmosphere, listening for the acoustic signal of radio waves from the ground, which of course, again, requires us to do quite a bit of theoretical work on how radio waves couple into an atmosphere like Venus and how we do source inversion there and then go one step further and do structural inversion on this planet. And then the, that's definitely, so that is a mission that maybe will never take place on Venus. But uh, the exciting thing, of course, then is in the next decade uh, when I'll be maybe retired or do something else, that will actually go to the outer solar system with seismology. And so this picture here is don't look at the big uh, planet, uh, look at the small planet in front of it, the moon of Saturn, which is Titan. And this is an actual image, the only image we have from the surface. And what looks like rocks here, this is actually frozen ice, so it's not a rock. It's frozen ice covered with dust of hydrocarbons. Um, below that is an icy crust of water ice. Below that water icy crust is an ocean that is hundreds of kilometers deep. Below that ocean, maybe another layer of high pressure ice of phases that don't even exist on the Earth. And only below that, the silicate mantle. Above all of that, you have an atmosphere made of nitrogen in, from which hydrocarbons are raining like methane. The soil on this planet will, I like the, the, uh, your mentioning of soil, actual soil studies, the soil on this planet will be hydrates between methane and ice. So seismology could actually tell how deep those are and when you're actually going to water ice, which may answer the question why the, or how the uh, atmosphere of Titan is replenishing. And yeah, all of that will happen um, with the Dragonfly mission, which is a mission that is so crazy that it's really uh, Jules Verne on speed, uh, this design. Uh, so it's an octocopter that can fly from one place to the other through the atmosphere of a moon in the Saturn system. Thankfully, it, has a, it will have a seismometer on a little winch um, going down to the ground whenever the thing is landing, and it will launch in 28, I think, and it will land on Titan for the first time in 2035. And I'm really looking forward to being an old man at SSA 2025, uh, 35 and listening to the first results of seismology on Titan. Thank you.
Well, I want to, I want to thank all three of our panelists for, for three really dynamic views of what's, what we're doing today at the cutting edge and where we're going to be going in the future. Uh, in the, the time we have remaining, I think it's time for us to have a little bit of discussion between the panel. And um, one of the themes that I see that comes up here is the, the challenges that we face between how to make the best use of, say, petascale computing, but now we're seriously talking about petascale data. Back when I was beginning, the data was confined to how many boxes of cards you could carry to the computer center. <laughs> but today we have, I think, a, again, a disconnect. And I'm not sure how we do that. Do we, do we need to put more intelligence in the sensor? Can we move systems to the field? Or what are your thoughts? Maybe I can start yes. and I'll see if you can uh, chime in. Uh, uh, definitely, I, I think this is a very hard question because there, I, I think the entire DAS community is trying to figure out what to do with this. Uh, amount of data, but we have to admit we are in a very early stage here, right? So, um, you know, in many cases, once you study a problem for a long time, you realize, oh, you actually don't need all that original resolution of data. You can actually compress the data uh, substantially. So I think there is definitely a lot of uh, learning we are doing now in the community here, a lot of design of better algorithm, like what Alex said, for computing problems. I think one major uh, issue is, at least, you know, what Alice said about their, you know, supercomputing powers, give me hope that this is not going to be a, a problem uh, in the long term. But we have to think of a way that we have to, you know, co-locate in some sense the, the kind of the data and your computing resources so that, you know, it's very hard to move this data around uh, to have efficient progress. Maybe you can. Right. It's a, it's a really good question, because actually that's always the question I ask from men. <laughs> How are they dealing with um, right. like this terabyte of data that are being collected just or in petabyte. a single day? Or right. Petabyte, yeah. right. <laughs> it's a um, good question. So I mean, there's a huge push um, in the scientific computing community for cloud computing, and that is um, specifically useful when you want to distribute mm -hmm. large data sets to the community. So they're not shipped for download anymore. You don't have to write in a, a big iris request and download data overnight. They're actually living in the cloud, and you just um, you can process them in the, in the cloud computing system and you can also um, yeah, do things like post-processing, filtering and so on without downloading the data. So I think this is probably the approach um, where this makes the most sense. And I know that NASA has been, for example, choosing to not be uh, really allowing download data anymore, but just distributing really on the cloud. So maybe you can comment okay. on this, you know, <laughs> but yeah, but that's, uh, uh, I think yeah. that's, a, that's um, uh, one approach at the moment that's very promising to do that. Right. Maybe I can add to that more is, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of better algorithm, you know, small project compressor data will work for a long time. But, you know, again, we need to think about how to scale up, right? We're really talking about like all the fibers in the world and in, you know, including in the ocean, right? At that point, you know, any solution will be very expensive. And I think this is something we have to think about as a community. This is not the conventional fat model you are doing. It turns out even you want to build that network, the most important resource is actually not their interrogation unit, it's the fiber. And we don't own any of the fibers. It's someone else, it's only all that fiber. So we have to find a sustainable long-term model for this to scale up. And there may have to be a business consideration here, like how to you know, really have a, you know, a, a system that would benefit us and the telecom industry. So everyone is on board to push this forward. Maybe my view on the problem is, of course, a slightly different one because, uh, uh, no, a slightly different perspective. I'm never worrying about petabytes. Uh, I'm worrying about one seismometer on another planet that records 100 <laughs> SPS. And the bulk of the data that is recorded will stay on that other planet and will never be transferred back to Earth. Mm -hmm. um, maybe on the moon, we could think about that. Uh, on Mars, probably not, um, unless Elon Musk does whatever Elon Musk wants to do. Um, <laughs> and in the outer solar system, never. So therefore, the moment we would, for example, do dark uh, distributed acoustic sensing on the moon, we would actually have to reduce the bandwidth significantly before any human can actually look at it uh, and before it's transferred back to Earth. So therefore, it's another thing I'm actually uh, curious how this will work in the next uh, years and year fields, um, how to work with data, compressed data, where you don't know yet what is interesting in the data. Of course, um, if, you're on a, if you already know what the data is like, it's easy to do an STA, LTA, whatever, on mm -hmm. the cutout windows. If you don't know yet whether you will have glitches or you'll have wind noise or um, titan monsters on the data, uh, 
you first have to look at the data to actually know what is interesting before you can make these decisions. And mm -hmm. uh, that's di difficult if your seismometer is elsewhere, yeah. So therefore, but maybe artificial intelligence will help us here to some extent. Um, yeah, so applications of machine learning, artificial intelligence are going to continue to be important. But I think you make a very good point about not knowing what we're looking for, because much of the discovery has been from the unknown. I think we have an online question here we'll take. Yes, uh, it's a relevant top uh, question that, well, to, to what we discussed here. The question is, uh, do we need more uh, dat uh, data standards and software library to communicate, exchange, and integrate data end to end? Didn't quite catch it. Yeah, I'm not sure we quite caught that. You take your mask off and sure. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. So the question is, do we need more data standard and software libraries to communicate, exchange, and integrate data end to end? Very good question. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, maybe I can quickly. And of course, my perspective is that a lot of these, uh, we have great standards, and I, I worked a bit in oceanographic um, institutions, and we're definitely better than them, specifically what is our metadata, and of course, they have different data. So it's, um, the, of course, the, the, the transition will be going from mini seed files that contain a single station to whatever does is recording, um, which is uh, not even single stations anymore, and that is, where we will need other standards, yes, <laughs> to answer. Yeah, I can just add that we, we have as a community, and we're really successful in establishing community standards, uh, also for software. And we, we do have large community efforts of uh, keeping that that way. So we, we actually, um, that, that also shows, right, in this decade long um, successful collaboration, that's just not possible if you don't have these standards. Nobody outside of our field could interact with us if you wouldn't have the open um, community driven software standards, for example, in our case, and wouldn't have community members that embrace this. <clears throat> yeah, I would say there are multiple groups in the DAS community try to address this problem, and one is coming up maybe slightly different uh, solution. I think that's very good. I mean, as you know, they both said, you know, our community is pretty good at this, but we need to it come organically from people who actually deal with data. I, <laughs> in the beginning, I naively sometimes inform, uh, force my group members to, to follow a certain standard, and in the end, it doesn't work. And in, they find out better ways to deal with the data, uh, more efficient, and they know better about the computers and uh, you know, databases. So, so I think it would be nice to have different groups try different things, organic come up, what's the best, best way of doing this from people who actually look at the data. You know, as a matter of fact, when you become faculty member, you don't look at data directly, which is a pity. Okay, I'd like to remind the audience, you're welcome to come to the microphones. If you have questions that you'd like to raise, we'd be certainly happy to discuss them. They are scared Do you have us. another one? Or? Yes, there's okay, another, yes. Uh, while people are coming to the uh, speaker, there's another burning question, you know, keep coming to the top, that maybe the question is more uh, to Alice. The question is, can you comment on the difference between the HPC environment in Europe versus US? What lessons can you can be drawn. What lessons can be drawn? Yeah, so both, um, um, both Europe and the US have the um, um, possibility for scientists to apply for um, compute time via, for example, Exceed or Praise or EuroHPC. Um, there's not that much of a difference in these, in these opportunities, and, I, I want, and there is a difference between um, going with uh, national supercomputing centers, where you're writing a proposal, or for going with commercial um, vendors like AWS or Google. This is, I think, a really large difference, because in one case, you, have, uh, to have a, you write a scientific case, you get reviewed from your peers, you get access. In the other case, it's always more of a, as you said, a business, a commercial um, understanding. So this is a really big change coming up. Um, and going more into with the commercialized um, support for science for different reasons. That is a very big um, change. And in terms of lessons learned, I would say um, one thing that is a lesson that we learned is in Europe that uh, we were very successful with uh, urgent response to the COVID uh, pandemic. So that's outside of seismology. And that's something we should, uh, we should um, use for our community and make the case that we need the same kind of urgent access and urgent resources for seismology. Because that has been really successful to uh, make these resources available in case of need in an uncomplicated and rapid um, way. So I think this is something we should push for. Great. I'd like to take a question now from the audience here. We have one here. Uh, hi, um, I have a follow-on to that point. Um, just getting access, of course, to the HPC itself is only one element. Um, if you're working with domain experts that are outside of seismology, say a group of 
of glaciologists or volcanologists that say want to do potentially exascale, very high frequency seismic simulations in a glacier or a volcano, it seems to me there's got to be a very strong interface to the computer science, to the capability of the code, to all the other details that are necessary to advance the science, whether it's for full waveform inversion or some other uh, uh, goal. So, you know, can we build some kind of facility or interface that can enable a typical small group, say, volcanologists to, to really e exploit these capabilities? Yes, absolutely. And this is, um, I was a bit too long, so I couldn't really fully elaborate that on the last slide. But this is exactly what, um, what is actually in the progress of, of being established now but with several, um, with several um, efforts to um, standardize this. And um, I had this point of like workflows services, um, digital twin components, but these are all just phrases for um, describing exactly what you said, providing this, um, providing community access for these developments for everybody to, uh, to access that. And then one important thing I mentioned that are, for example, containers, so that's something we're using to, to really ease, um, lower the barrier of uh, getting started with these things. It's some pre-compiled little environment, you download it on your laptop, and ideally you can just turn your little laptop in a supercomputer and um, you know, run smaller scale models, but use the same tools. It's the same infrastructure that you would use on a large machine. And that is, um, that is something that is uh, happening as, as we speak. That's great. So that, yeah. that will really be transformative for a, a huge sector of the community. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Another? Yeah, I, I have to ask this question um, before the lunch. Uh, there was a question for students. The question goes, what recommendations do you have for students just getting into seismology in terms of how they can prepare for those new frontiers? Be open. Uh, yeah, be open. Um, I mean, with, with, uh, maybe I'll start with planetary seismology. It's pretty obvious now is the time. I mean, if you did planetary seismology 15 years ago, you could go back to the Apollo data with all the caveats that I mentioned in terms of scattering. Um, now you have the inside mission is close to over in terms of collecting data, but the data set is there and the data set will be there in 10 years and in 15 years. And other missions will be flying, American ones, Chinese ones, hopefully also European ones. And um, so that is uh, now is the time as a young person. <laughs> to look into that and yeah, communi communicate with, but communicate with terrestrial seismologists first. That's always good. Don't start becoming a planetary seismologist. Um, rather become an observational seismologist on Earth first, and then you know what to look for on other planets. <laughs> I, I, I think what uh, Alison said about being open is really you know, a good suggestion. Uh, also be brave, I guess. You know, some of these new frontiers are kind of scary, right? You think about, <laughs> all their barriers and the steep learning curves in the beginning. Uh, but you know, if there are open data sets like the one I mentioned, I encourage you to, to try them. You know, only by, by doing you know, this, in this kind of new frontier and you're learning that way. There's no other way of learning how to do it. Yep. I, can, I can maybe shortly add, so we didn't stage that, but we kind of all had in our slides the importance of interdisciplinarity and open-mindedness. So and I think that is an important point. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to ask the same question, but maybe just a little different twist on it, that the, clearly today issues of climate change and sustainability are extremely important. And Zhang Wen, you touched on this a little bit in terms yeah. of new, new areas and opportunities for seismology. I'd be interested as to what the three of you think as we, we look outside of the normal box of looking at earthquakes and so on. What, what should we be exploring? How can we best do that with these new opportunities? I actually think that's a great question, right? It's, if you look at the society, climate change, you know, water problems, wildfire problems, just to say in California, there are others in other places. That's what people actually care about. They still care about the earthquake, but they care about these other things as well, unless a big earthquake happened, right? So, you know, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so we have to really embrace that. I think really, you know, Part of the point is some of the new technologies we have or new capabilities we have are opening us up this new opportunity so we can really make an impact there. Uh, so I think we should really embrace this challenge. 
I will dodge your question, so therefore, if at least want to answer it <laughs> first. Um. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I totally agree, of course, with what was just said. But I also want to point out that this uh, um, also opens opportunities for uh, for us um, to enhance fundamental understanding in seismology by bringing in new data, bringing in maybe new techniques, and benefit from the expertise of other fields, working with them, or, yeah, connecting other observations and. Uh, to our data sets is actually um, is actually a, it would be it would be an advantage, and climate change um, is also kind of probing systems that have been uh, maybe more steady over the last uh, decades, or at least during the instrumental record we have so far. And there's a really rapid environmental change coming up that um, will um, produce signals or data, um, and also requires models that we haven't have seen during the last decade. So it's actually also a scary, but um, it is an opportunity that we should uh, react to. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to dodge climate change. The other question, of course, what the uh, because we can't do anything about to help here. Um, the thing that uh, planetary science is, of course, I mean, what changed in the last 20 years here um, is that, that we know now how many exoplanets, plants, and other solar systems exist. 20 or five years ago, we didn't know of one, and now we have thousands. And yet, we to understand them, we have only basically the handful of planets in the inner solar system um, that we can actually study and co calibrate our models on. And I think that is something that is uh, that can be sold to the public actually quite well. I mean, we, if we want to know whether any of these so-called habitable planets out there is indeed habitable, we need to understand how plate tectonics work, why we have plate tectonics on Earth, why we don't have it on Mars, whether we have it on Venus or not. And uh, yeah, their seismology can play its little part in understanding that. Great. Well, this hour has completely blown by, and I want you to join me in thanking our three panelists for giving us these wonderful insights. Great. Thanks so thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.